Hi, I'm Nikia Parker. I'm an assistant professor of history at Michigan State University. And my research and teaching interests are chattel slavery, uh, specifically US slavery in the 19th century, um, American Indian history and gender and slavery. Awesome, thank you for uh, being here with us tonight. Uh, today we're gonna re uh, talk about your article regarded as an appendage of his family, slavery, family, and the law in Indian territory. Um, so could you tell us kind of what the article is about and why you wrote it or what you were hoping to achieve with it? Yeah, so the article actually is um, a chapter from my dissertation that I'm now revising into a book manuscript. And so I revised that chapter in article form. And so um, why don't I tell you a bit about my larger project and then where the article fits in. So my book manuscript, um, Ta Trails of Tears and Freedom, Black Life in Indian Slave Country, 1830 to 1866. It looks at the lived experiences of enslaved people in the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations, specifically from the time of Indian removal, or when the Indian Removal Act was signed in 1830 to emancipation in the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations, which was 1866. So a year after the American Civil War ended. And I'm happy to talk about that a little later too. Um, so as far as their experiences, I look at what their lives were like when they were forced to go on the removal track to be expelled with their indigenous enslavers from the original homelands in the South to Indian territory, what we now consider present day Oklahoma, and then look out, look at how enslaved people rebuilt their lives in Indian territory. What kind of families did they form? What types of resistance did they practice? How did they learn about this new homeland? As you can imagine, Indian territory looks quite different in some ways, physical geography, social geography, for example, the people that they were surrounded by included not just Choctaw and Chickasaw enslavers, but enslavers from other indigenous nations like the Cherokee and Creek, and included slave societies like the states of Texas and Arkansas, but enslaved people also had to face other indigenous groups like the Comanche, the Wichita, Caddo. What did that look like? for them is essentially what my project is. It's a social history. And so where this chapter or where this article falls in is um, about family and kinship and how in particular the laws of the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations, laws regarding slavery, free black people, um, what we call miscegenation, how that hardened um, after removal and in Indian territory, the very structured laws that were put in place that really degraded any kind of blackness, but how, you know, things look different on the ground, right? So my article looks at how enslaved people as well as indigenous people fought back against these laws or how they formed families, how they resisted these laws. Um, but ultimately, it discusses also the limit of how far kinship can grow. And I think that's evident by the Laney case that as much as her Chickasaw kin fought for her, um, even taking it to the Texas Supreme Court, in the end, they still were not considered truly family, right? In, in the end, they were labeled as black and not worthy of, of kinship. Um, and this was the experience for a lot of enslaved women in Indian territory. So as a whole, that's what my project is and that's where the article fits in. Well, thank you for the overview. I, it uh, puts it a lot in context. Um, so to begin kind of our discussion, one of the things that um, I think a lot of people were surprised by is uh, that these Native American tribes owned slaves, Africa, you know, black slaves. And how did that come to be? What was slavery like in the Indian territories? Yes, happy to answer that question. I was surprised too. <laughs> That's why I took on this project. Um, actually, it started as um, a history major in undergrad. I was an undergrad at the State University of New York at New Paltz, and I was taking a class on the Civil War, and I wanted to do a final project that centered on Indigenous Americans and their participation in the Civil War. So I didn't know too much about it. 
And I thought that what I would find <laughs> was that a lot of indigenous people were fighting for the union, that they were abolitionists, and certainly some were, but my professor shocked me when he told me, well, you may wanna look at Confederate records too, because five nations in particular that were in the Southeastern part of the United States had slavery. That blew my mind. <laughs> so the five nations in particular um, that practiced chattel slavery were the Creek, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole. And of course, there were captivity practices, forms of slavery before invasion, European invasion of their homelands. Um, but these captivity practices were quite fluid. You were not born into slavery. There was not a racial component to it. Um, a lot of times captive people had rights. They could marry. Um, they, they didn't have to be a captive or a slave all their life. But of course, with the introduction of chattel slavery, then you have some indigenous people who decide to engage in this practice for whether it's political reasons, economic reasons, they find it profitable and advantageous to do so. And so you have these same nations that once the federal government decides that it wants to expel them, ironically, to have their lands for slavery, right, and the expansion of cotton, um, they are also taking the institution and practice and people, enslaved people, with them to Indian territory and set up the same kind of slaveholding communities, um, structures in place to keep chattel slavery in effect. It happens in Indian territory too. And I would say to a certain extent in the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations, it actually becomes even um, more entrenched in society. And what I mean by that is you see laws that show that if you were a citizen of either one of these nations, you had the obligation to capture self-liberated people. Um, you were fined if you had a relationship with a Black person or someone of Black and Native descent. And so this is even more entrenched than it was before removal. You didn't really see laws before removal that specific about slavery. And so that's how the institution expanded. And that's why all five nations, when it came to the Civil War, they one of the main reasons they sided with the Confederacy was because of the institution of slavery. Yeah, and I, I found that incredibly shocking, uh, just the, the way in which the um, Chickasaw were able to kind of uh, incorporate not only slavery, but also patriarchy, which yes. you mentioned, because I'd, I'd like to speak a little bit more about that too, because I think it's so important, especially when we get to the Laney case. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so what's interesting about um, indigenous ideas of gender, gender relations, is um, you did not see, as you saw in the United States or in other European or in European nations, where it was a patriarchal society. In fact, just the opposite for the Choctaw and Chickasaw and other nations like the Cherokee. It was matrilineal. So line of descent came through the mother. That means political and social power came through the mother's line. So for example, um, your uncle, right, your mother's brother would actually take the father role for many indigenous people. And you see that in cases like the Colberts and the Pitchlands who are mentioned in that article. Their political power came from actually their uncles, right, their mother's brothers, not on their father's side. Um, what's really interesting and a, and a point I share with my students, they, they always seem really tickled over is the word for husband in the Cherokee language is the man that I live with. So as you can see, it's definitely not a patriarchal society by, by any means, traditionally. However, with what's called um, the civilization program, maybe I should back up and explain that. So um, when the revolution happens, you have a new republic, that really changes things for indigenous people um, because they are facing um, a republic that needs land. They are facing um, a republic that wants to assert its power and sovereignty. And there are no more European powers really to play off of. And so they have to deal with the United States. 
And one of the things that early on, even in George Washington's um, cabinet, right, I would say Secretary of War Henry Knox, what they come up with as a plan to deal with indigenous people is called the Civilization Program. And they feel that if they can, um, and it's, that's a really touchy word, and I'm using it in the old old way, right? 19th century way, civilization, is that if they can civilize indigenous people, in other words, get them to accept no white norms like patriarchy, like Christianity, right? Like learning the English language, certain farming techniques, um, that that would help the United States with the land, right? And, and because they would sign treaties, right? They wouldn't need so much land if they were just sedentary farmers and the father was the head of the household and not matrilineal. And so some nations, in particular the Choctaw, the five nations we um, talked about, but I'll focus on the Choctaw and Chickasaw. Some nations really took to the civilization program and they adopted it in their way, right? They thought of it as a, way that perhaps we could maintain our sovereignty, um, but still seem as if we're cooperating, right? It was really just a strategy to maintain sovereignty. But one of the norms that a lot of people accept is, is the patriarchal one. So then you will see um, where now there are laws that the father is now the head of the household. The father now, um, the line comes through the Choctaw or Chickasaw father and not the mother. Um, fathers sometimes um, have more power as far as in probate court, wills, divorces. Um, and despite all that, though, one thing that I want to bring out in my book project is that despite this turn to patriarchy and indigenous women losing some political and social power, one of the ways that they're able to reclaim some of this power, I argue, is through slavery, particularly with um, women who own, if it's just two enslaved people or 10. You can see that the way that they manage their own plantations, the way that they are intent on keeping enslaved people through, even through legal means of if necessary, um, looking at enslaved people's testimony, right? It very, I, what I find is very similar to um, what Stephanie Jones Rogers, an historian who wrote on white women enslavers, wonderful book a few years ago. And she mentions that if you want to know what slavery is like, listen to enslaved people. Right? And enslaved people with white women enslavers, they knew who was in charge. They're like, she's in charge. She owns us. Well, in the testimonies that I've looked at with enslaved people in Indian territory, they say the same thing. They, they know, they'll say that we actually belong, she married a white man, we belong to her. Or um, this particular Choctaw woman enslaver, she wouldn't allow anyone to touch us. She was the only one who um, was allowed to deal with us. So it's quite, it's quite interesting. And I think, again, that plays out in the Laney case. <laughs> well, and, and I've uh, read that book that you mentioned, and, and it was stunningly uh, um, appalling, I guess is the word, mm -hmm. to um, see how just entw entwined a whole group of people who have kind of tried to distance themselves throughout history from the, from mm -hmm. the slave trade. Uh, we're very active in generational wealth. And I, I'd kind of like you to speak more about how a slave would actually create wealth for a woman in a way that you know she wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, so one example I can point to that I've seen is um, during the removal period. And so um, with the Choctaw and Chickasaw, um, the way that their treaties worked was that until um, they were ready to remove, which is such a benign term, but before they were expelled, they were allowed to have certain plots of land for themselves to own outright. And then when they were ready to go to Indian territory, they could sell that land. And so you see a lot of reports that show that many indigenous people sold their land for, to get more enslaved people which in a practical sense, an economic sense, right? That, that's totally, you can understand that. You can't 
keep your land, you can't bring that with you, but you can bring another form of property with you that can help you rebuild an Indian territory. And women take advantage of, of those terms. Um, there's one example that I read that is of a woman who um, actually was deceived by a speculator, right, a slave trader, and she did not get the enslaved people that she was supposed to. And she consistently petitioned the Indian agent, or um, so the white person in charge of removal in the Choctaw agents at the Choctaw agency, as well as she petitioned Choctaw political leaders to speak in her behalf and say, give me my enslaved people, give me what I was entitled to. And she eventually, she gets the enslaved people that she wanted and is, and she's like, now I can move, I can, I can go because now I have my property. Um, in Indian territory, you see indigenous women participating in the domestic slave trade. They will um, go to New Orleans and they will purchase enslaved people. Sometimes they can purchase, purchase enslaved people from other family members or from other enslavers in Indian territory, like Cherokee enslavers. Indigenous women will also trade a lot with Texas as well. So they're very active in the domestic slave trade and just they know what acquire, acquiring enslaved people means, right? Even just one enslaved person makes a difference as far as labor, um, as far as money. You can, um, there's another interesting woman. Her name is Sarah Harlan. She was a Choctaw woman who was what we would consider a planter meaning an enslaved an enslaver who enslaves 20 or more people, so wealthy. And she would talk about in her memoirs, um, I hired out this person for $5 a day. I hired out this person for $10 a day. She mentioned those were the economic um, decisions that her father helped her come to. So very similar to white women enslavers where they're from an early age, they are taught how to be an enslaver. And Again, you you see this in indigenous communities as well. I, you know, I hate to say that it looked similar to what we see in the Deep South, but a lot of the way slavery was practiced in these nations looked very similar to what we've seen in white communities in the Deep South. Well, maybe now we could talk a little bit more about what makes there were some differences. And one of the things that I think you bring up is, um, and you kind of really do a good job of this, is the um, idea of the kind of the, the family unit and redefining the family unit. You mentioned um, kind of how these, uh, sometimes when, if someone had a group of slaves or one slave and the parents were died, the orphans were often taken care of by the enslaved person. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a whole complicated fraught. Yes. <laughs> so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. It is so, it is very fraud. I, I had to be very, very nuanced with that discussion um, because again, it's dealing with the sources as with it, any historian, but particularly with scholars of slavery, you really have to be careful and, and, and read and dissect the sources because a lot of the examples of enslaved people acting as guardians are from white missionaries, right? Who have a very particular perspective, say racist perspective of what indigenous people are like, what their work ethic and families are like. And so some of those ideas are, are shading their descriptions. And yet they're valuable sources to see what happened on the ground. And and so I do think for some enslaved people, um, you know, thinking about their choices, and I mentioned this in the article, like where could they, where could they go? Right, Texas, which was even more entrenched with slavery, Arkansas, Mexico, which had abolished slavery in the 1830s, is is hundreds of miles away, and enslaved people always made a way out of no way and formed kinship and communities where they could. And it was no different in Indian territory. And so if they could form bonds with indigenous people, even sometimes if they were in, enslaved, 
they did, right? And it could be for strat very strategic purposes. Maybe there wasn't a true love there with who was called Uncle Phil, but maybe he was strategized and thought, what are my options? You know, this is the community that I know. Perhaps he was even um, related somehow to a Choctaw. I mentioned the law that stated that you, um, if you were black, you had to leave. But if you were black and un, they said unconnected, right, with with Choctaw or, or Chickasaw, that fraught term blood. And so that leads us that leads us to imply that if you were connected in some way, you could stay and were protected by the community. Perhaps that was the case with these enslaved people. But also just, you know, they're not a lot, they're just not a lot of choices. And so if you can make a life, right, even as an enslaved person, if you can find a little bit of joy, if you can find a little bit of community and family that makes life easy, and that's what easier, and that's what's known to you, feel like that's the choice that you're going to make. And that's what it seems like with some of these enslaved guardians. And perhaps indigenous people, you know, we have exam other examples too of indigenous people who viewed enslaved people or even free black people as part of the community and protected them as well. So it, it went both ways, but I don't, I think those were the exceptions rather than the rule. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought they were interesting because it does lead to that kind of, um, you know, what is this, what is happening on the ground and mm -hmm. why is it happening? I think people, especially the enslaved, may have been looking for stability, as you say in your article. Right? So right, yes. One of the biggest fears was what happens when the master dies? Are we going to be sold? Are we going to be broken up? All that kind of absolutely but let's now talk about the Lanny case okay. uh, Lanny Colbert and uh this totally illustrates everything you were just talking about almost perfectly yeah so <laughs> yeah so let me talk a little bit about that case yes yeah let's talk about Lanny uh, Colbert who she was what happened to her yeah, it's such a fascinating case. Um, so this is a case that actually ended up in the Texas Supreme Court uh, because um, Laney's father, who was very, a very prominent man named Colbert, um, decreed that she would be manumitted as an infant. Um, it was a um, friend of his, actually a family member, right? <laughs> a brother-in-law married to his sister. Um, who um, actually enslaved Laney and her mother. And so it was um, James Gunn, right, the enslaver of Laney, who declared that she would be um, free, that she was not ever, she was not considered a slave. It was documented, it was side notarized. Um, and yet somehow <laughs> when Indian in Indian territory after removal, things go awry. And it is actually Lainey's family, right? Her aunt who declares, no, actually, she was always an enslaved person. And as an enslaved person, I have the right to sell her to whoever I want to. And she sold Lainey and her descendants to someone named Robert Jones, who, um, for anyone who knows Choctaw history, um, very wealthy, politically connected Choctaw enslaver. Perhaps one of the richest enslavers before the antebellum era. Some historians estimate that he enslaved over 500 people. Yeah, and so he takes, he has a plantation um, along the Red River, so bordering Texas and Oklahoma. And this, this fight over manumission happens over years. And finally, it gets to the Texas Supreme Court. And essentially what the, the Supreme Court argues is, well, we don't have any control over what happens in the Dia Nations. They're free to decide matters. And so the, man, the document is legal. We see nothing wrong with it. Free, free Laney and her descendants. And so you think that would be the end of the story. It's not. Right? So they're captured quite a few times and tried to be brought back in enslavement and sometimes take it to Texas. And so there's one incident that I think I mentioned in the article too, where um, 
she's forced her nephew, who is left in charge of protecting the family, has to go to Texas and bring them back, literally physically bring them back with force into Indian territory. So it's just, it's so, it's so convoluted. But I think how I'll wrap up um, explaining the case is that what it shows is that there are people who formed family bonds, kinship bonds, right? But that these ideas of slavery and blackness always loom over them. And also um, I think it shows how fluid things could be. Right between, even though you have this very, this society where slavery is strictly enforced. Um, if you are a free black person, you could not stay or else you'd be re-enslaved, right? Also why the Laney case is so important too, because they are allowed to stay, right? They they have Chickasaw kin that protect them, even despite, despite this law. Um, and you also see, um, I think it adds something to slavery scholarship, because we talk about enslaved women and sexual violence and assault or and also these enter the in, the connections between enslaved enslavers and black women and how we describe it. And then you have the Laney case that really shows that enslaved women faced very similar, horrible circumstances and decisions that in Black women in white societies face too. And I think that's something that's been understudied in our field. We have um, wonderful work on um, family, in particular families, like micro histories of families and Black women, how they navigated this. But I think as a whole, zooming out and looking at the experiences of enslaved women and how they try to sometimes leverage these relationships, how that failed, how that worked. I think that's a larger conversation that I wanted to broach with this. Um, I hope that that explained the case. <laughs> it does without like getting into the, every single- Yeah, it's of, convoluted. It's, it's a long back and forth. But I think that's that to me, it's kind of hitting the nail that you were just hitting is that like, that is so important and thank you for your work on this because I think that the the idea of you know empowerment and holding together family units and then this whole notion of uh, the matrilineal condition of the child only being changed by the white father is huge. I mean that's something that has not been explored enough. I don't think. So I agree. So I, it's, uh, I think that's where scholarship needs to go, I agree with you, so. Yeah, really I agree. And you know, like, it's so interesting. I'm glad that you brought that up because yeah, this happens through Lainey's father, not mother. So again, it shows just the inverse of, of traditional ideas about matrilineal and gender relations in indigenous um, societies like the Chickasaw and Choctaw. Right, that the fact that it's it's the father who is decreeing, no, my my child should be manumitted at a particular age. She should live as a free person. She should be protected by her kin. And that it's the women in the family, Molly Gunn, right, who are the one is the one that resents this and that actually says no, no, she should be re-enslaved. Um, and what's interesting, and what I'll talk about more in my book manuscript that Laney's case is not unusual. There were other cases too that involved um, these type of, of interactions where they're freed by the indigenous father and it is actually indigenous women in the family, whether it's um, the wife, niece, aunt, who are the ones that um, push back against it. And so that's one of, my, one of the things I'm exploring in my books. Like, what does that mean, right? What does, what does that mean for the institution? What does that mean for indigenous societies, women? What does that mean for black women too? And, and how things, and, and these, these conflicts that you see in the antebellum era, they explode after the civil war and during reconstruction. And what's important is that we really take a deep look at slavery, because that's where these conflicts start, is then. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think one of the articles, one of the things the article does well too is it really shows how the, the corrosive ideology of slavery. Yeah. So it, it trumps all the other, you know, it really just kind of seeps right into the, the Native American culture and legal system and, and defines it in a way that like even white supremacy doesn't quite hit. You know, somehow, I mean, slavery is white supremacy, but you know, you know what I mean by that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, I find it so um, interesting that, yeah, that, that they're very specific about, you know, they use the word Negro, right? The, the old term that we use for Black or African American, but they're very specific about if you are any type of Black, <laughs> any connection to Blackness, you, you don't have you don't have rights. You you can't be family. You can't be kin. And of course, it looks different on the ground. But eventually, you know that the law, the earlier law that says if you're unconnected, you you can't stay here. Like that eventually gets to be like just if you are black in any way, you have no rights. And also, they they very much differentiate like what a citizen, who a citizen would be. Right, as opposed to who wouldn't be a citizen. And Blackness is, is connected with that. Um, and again, you see that play out during Reconstruction and in the Emancipation Era, but it starts, it starts during slavery. Um, you know, the, it's the proper condition they feel of someone of African descent is, is slavery. Right. And one thing that I find interesting too, that I'm also exploring more in my book manuscript is um, you mentioned like these ideas of race and, and blackness and how it, how it melds with white supremacy. And one of the things that's so interesting, like this, this culture of anti-blackness, right? It, it's even evident in things like newspapers, Choctaw and Chickasaw newspapers, where there's, um, you know, there's racial epithets in newspapers, there's racist stereotype stories like very similar to you know like menstrual shows and you know the idea of you know black people have less intellect um in addition to you know advertising slave sales and it's it's there even in the social fabric and so normally our the standard narrative is well you know slavery did exist in these nations but it was just a small group and they were elite and they, that's and they control the political and social, and that's why you know we we see these laws. But what I'm trying to show with my work is that no, actually, anti-blackness, the institution of slavery, it seeped down to every aspects of aspect of society. And even if you were a non-slaveholding indigenous person, there was still this prevalent culture of anti-blackness in the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations that, unfortunately, some people were shaped by. Well, and this may be an unfair question because I'm springing it on you, but um, how do you think these um, groups react to their history today? Have you encountered any of that? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's, it's fraught. I know I use that word a lot. Um, it, is, it is fraught. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to talk about. Um, I remember an incident a few years ago, um, and this was brought up by a wonderful um, Black woman who's a genealogist, and she's Black Choctaw. Her name is Angela Walton Raji. And she did a screenshot of um, the Chickasaw public history website, and they were recounting their history. And the way that they described how black people, how enslaved people got into their nation was um, they were uh, runaways, self-liberated people who were trying to escape and we took them in. And then when we were removed to Indian territory, we brought them with us. It's like, that doesn't sound quite like the history, <laughs> the correct history. And she called them out for it. Eventually they took it down, right? But I give that example to show that it, it has been covered over, right? It has been hidden. Um, you will see in, uh, for example, I believe it's the Smithsonian, um, the American Indian Museum, the Smithsonian, that when it talks about Civil War participation, what they will highlight is, well, it's because the federal government 
fail to um, buy by treaties and fail to pay annuities. And that's why they signed with the Confederacy. Well, I mean, partly that is true. Of course, they did not abide by treaties. They did not um, pay annuities regularly. But, you know, slavery played a big part too. <laughs> and that's openly admitted by 19th century Choctaw and Chickasaw political leaders as well as other Native leaders. But that's papered over. And then I'll give another Another example, too, very recently of Maxine Waters and the head of the Choctaw Nation, Gary Batten, actually having a back and forth because uh, Representative Maxine Waters wanted to um, create um, a law that stated that if Indigenous nations who participated in slavery did not accept um, descendants of freed people as citizens because they they kick them out of the nation, right? The Cherokee is different. They're trying to atone, but other nations know. Um, she said that, well, you shouldn't, that should affect your tribal uh, payments that you get, your annuities that you get. And of course, the Choctaw leader, right? He saw that as a front to sovereignty, but his response also was ahistorical. Essentially what he said, and he wrote to Nancy Pelosi, actually, because he wanted her to, um, to get on Maxine right, Waters, right, to censor her. And he said, well, you know, slavery is America's problem. It's not ours. How Black people are treated has nothing to do with us. So again, you see just the complete ignoring, right, of slavery even existing. Um, and yeah, I've received some of that pushback or, you know, why, why would you study slavery <laughs> among, among Native people? Like, like they're two marginalized groups. Why are you getting on one of the marginalized groups, right? Um, yeah, but it's like, I feel, you know, history has to be told in all its ugliness for us to understand it, for us to get, to, to try to make some sort of headway. We have to, we have to do that. Even if, you know, marginalized people hurt other marginalized people, oppressed people could hurt other op oppressed people. Um, and so, yeah, it's not an easy topic to talk about for sure. <laughs> No, and it seems very consistent with how um, slavery is talked about in general. So yes. again, the slavery ideology is extending itself throughout history, and we're continually having to push back against the infernal lies. Of oh, absolutely. One thing I try to highlight to my students when I teach um, this topic is you know, we also have to consider what indigenous people went through too, right? The, the land dispossession, expulsion, the not honoring treaties, right? Just disrespect of sovereignty. We cannot ignore that. But also, you know, the, these things are intertwined, right? So without the dispossession of indigenous land and people, you don't have the expansion of slavery. But you also have the expansion of slavery because indigenous people brought enslaved people with them and they are intertwined stories. And that's what we need to talk about. Just like we need to talk about, you know, they're Buffalo soldiers that dispossessed native people in the West at the same time that they're also trying to get rights and land. So it's, we have to talk about these histories together, no matter how unpleasant it is. <laughs>